I went back to Yale to start a PhD because I had revered these professors and for me the greatest good in life is the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. It was the privilege of being able to study the greatest works ever written and I thought that the Yale professors when I left to study in English, I held them in such high esteem when I went back I realized that they were speaking madness and nonsense and they were also repeating themselves endlessly. It was an intellectual crisis because mm -hmm. I really had revered these people and realized that they were frauds. Heather McDonald is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a contributing editor of their delicious journal, City Journal, and the author of three books and a wide range of hard-hitting essays on homeland security, immigration, policing, homelessness, education, welfare reform, California politics, feminism, and symphony orchestras, <laughs> among other topics. Heather, welcome to The American Mind. Well, thank you so much, Charles. It's a delight. Uh, it's uh, great to have you here. I thought we'd spend the first segment talking a little bit about your own, uh, the intellectual and the political path that you have walked. Um, tell me about your education. What, where did you go to school? What did you study? Well, I uh, went ultimately to Yale as an undergraduate, where I unfortunately transferred what has always been an interest and love of language and a fascination with how language worked into what was then the dominant intellectual trend of the time which was deconstruction. So and was Paul Mann there when you were an undergraduate? Paul DeMann was a god among <laughs> graduate students in comparative literature yeah. and among clueless undergraduates like myself who were attracted to what felt like a dangerous uh, secret knowledge that mm -hmm. proved the impossibility of knowledge. Uh, and I wasted what could have been an extraordinary four years delving into actual literature. Instead, I spent my time struggling with impenetrable theory. French theory, Jacques Derrida, who was the mm -hmm. uh, most associated with the theory of deconstruction, would come regularly and be surrounded by a, 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 a swarm of sycophantish graduate students that were unwilling to say that what this man was saying was nonsense and instead elevated it to the highest form of truth. Can you define deconstructionism for our listeners? Well, Derrida always said it is undefinable, which is a very convenient <laughs> yes, position. Very convenient. Yes. Uh, but it, it's a theory that all human existence is a product of language. As, as counterintuitive as, as this sounds, they would say there is no human self, there is only language. We are a fiction of language. But at the same time, they also say that language is inherently a failure, that no, no stable meaning is possible, and that language, although the self doesn't exist, language has consciousness in, its, in a sense because language is always aware of its own failure. And so the <laughs> goal in every reading yes. for Paul de Man and Jacques Derrida was to find, allegedly, and this is all a fiction, mind you, I now have, to my <laughs> sadness, learned too late that it was all a fiction, but they will say that every text is aware of its own failure and they would find a set of metaphors in a book of Proust say mm -hmm. uh, Swan's Way that they claimed showed that the language there knew that its entire enterprise of signification was bound to fail. It was absurd. Utterly it, absurd. Utterly absurd. Now, um, were you attracted to this? I oh, was attracted. Oh. I was, for me, having, I loved, for instance, Moby Dick as a high school student because mm -hmm. of the sheer craziness and wildness and exuberance of the language. Mm -hmm. Melville's descriptions of, of the color of water at night and the, mm -hmm. and the play of moonlight was 
an example of what language can do. So when I came to Yale, and here they were talking about language, talking about interpretation, how do we communicate, it drew me in. Uh, and the one good thing I will say about it, I was, as an undergraduate in the 1970s, multiculturalism had not yet hit. Mm -hmm. So although the literary theory was crazy, we were allowed to read the greatest works that were ever written that happened to be by dead white males, mm -hmm. and nobody thought to question it. <laughs> Paul de Man and Jacques Derrida were elitists. Yeah. They, I think, would have been appalled by what happened in the 1980s when people started applying gender and race uh, tests to what you were allowed to read. So although I wasted time in theory, I got to read Milton and Chaucer and Spencer and I wrote my senior thesis on Wordsworth on 12 lines of the prelude <laughs> that I thought were all about the yeah. failure of representation. But at least I was in an environment that honored great literature in a perverse way, but nevertheless the canon was still intact. And for that I am extraordinarily grateful. And uh, do you keep up your membership in the uh, Deconstructionist Club? For a while, my, my goal when uh, years later was to write the definitive deconstruct, uh, deconstruction of deconstruction. Right, I wanted right. to prove its refutation. <laughs> and I would go and hang out at St. Mark's Bookstore in New York on St. Mark's Place that still kept a huge shelf of impenetrable theory. Uh, and I, I ended up going about it in sort of small, smaller bore ways. But what, what finally brought me to wisdom and common sense was studying linguistics at Cambridge University mm -hmm. after college. And there... So you were there for a master's I was uh, there for degree. a master's and studied linguistics and got very interested in speech act theory, J.L. Austin and, and mm -hmm. John Searle that we're also talking about language, but, but with a sense of its possibility and success of how we do things with language. And I went back to Yale to start a PhD because I had revered these professors. And for me, the greatest good in life is the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. It was the privilege of being able to study the greatest works ever written. And I thought that the Yale professors, when I left to study in English, I held them in such high esteem when I went back, I realized that they were speaking madness and nonsense, and they were also repeating themselves endlessly. It was an intellectual crisis, because mm -hmm. I really had revered these people and realized that they were frauds. So. And, and at that point, you decided, strangely, perhaps, to turn to law school. Well, it wasn't <laughs> strange, actually. It was, unfortunately, I still had the theory bug in me, and I sought out the legal version of deconstruction, which mm -hmm. was critical legal theory, because I was still oh, you're interested. Kidding. I had no idea. Yes, yeah. I went to Stanford because it was very dominant mm -hmm. there. I still believe that deconstruction was under one thing correctly, which is the inevitability of interpretation, mm -hmm. and the that language is com is complex and problematic. I, I disagree with a lot of conservatives in that I don't believe in a single truth. I'm enough of a deconstructionist that I think that when it comes to complex forms of meaning that there is never going to be agreement. I don't believe, for instance, and this will may be very controversial, that there's a single meaning to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I think reading is, is an extraordinarily uh, complicated act that involves bringing the reader's subjectivity to bear on it. So, so law school was for me an extension of doing theory in a slightly uh, less insane version, uh, <laughs> but, but also had possi the possibility maybe of doing something practical, but it, I, I was really more interested in. So you were not once burned, twice shy. You were twice no, burned. No, I twice, at twice burned. At least at last count, you are <laughs> twice burned. It took a while. It took a while for it to all flush out. Now, my, my sources inform me that you had a clerkship with Stephen Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit, who's probably the most liberal or was the most liberal judge on a very liberal uh, circuit. So were your politics uh, uh, suitably left at this point, uh, given your academic background? Or were you, were you moving right? Where were you? I was a liberal by default. I was not political, but I, anybody in this culture that has not thought hard about things is a liberal by default because they are surrounded mm 
by unspoken assumptions about uh, the unfairness of American society. Uh, emblematic, after I came back from um, England, I, I had brought a, a lovely 10-speed bike, a Holdsworth bicycle. Mm -hmm. And I was back at Yale, and it was parked outside the Yale Law School. And it was stolen one night. And my view was, how can I complain? I was, I, I was sort of onto the white privilege thing before it mm -hmm. became a, 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 an <laughs> obsession of the academic elite. But I really felt, without any understanding of, of what ghetto culture was about, that, well, the boys who took it, and, and as clueless as I was about uh, urban politics mm -hmm. at that point, mm -hmm. I knew enough to assume it was probably black kids that stole it. I had the typical liberal guilt, which is they deserved it. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of a microcosm of, with all due respect, because there's many things that I respect about Stephen Reinhardt, and he was a fabulous writer, and he believed in clarity of language, and that was a training for me. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I would say that that liberal guilt and that belief that they deserve it is, is emblematic of his jurisprudence. So at that point, um, I fit in. He now says I was this one clerk that went bad uh, because my my movement, uh, which had begun implicitly, although I wasn't aware of it, with my disillusionment with deconstruction, uh, and then my uh, horror at what was happening in the university was was already underfoot. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.